Welcome again. We are going to start with our executive panel and we would like to end with a smile because we had a great day of content of insights about corporate mobility. And in this executive panel, we are going to share with you why your corporate mobility future is shining bright. We have three guests for you. I'm going to present them, of course. Uh, let me present Remco Timmer. Remco Timmer is the director of product manager management, sorry, at Here Technologies. And Here Technologies is one of our founding partners. Remco, welcome. How's it going in the Netherlands? Pretty good. It's very warm today, which is quite rare in the Netherlands. So we're enjoying that. Yeah, I think that we have uh, almost the same kind of weather here in Belgium. So probably after this conference, we can go outside and enjoy the sun. The second guest and speaker is Vincent Flans. Vincent Flans is president corporate sales at Sixth, and also Sixth is a founding partner. Vincent, welcome, welcome to the conference. Good to see you, Stephen. I'm a little bit back, two days uh, back of you, so I expect on Saturday a very warm day to uh, celebrate outside. Okay, because you are, of course, based in Munich, uh, lovely Munich, and so we hope that you can enjoy a nice weekend. And then Franck Levesque, we already saw Franck this morning. Franck Levesque um, is the partner business unit leader mobility group at Frost & Sullivan, and Frost & Sullivan is co-organizing this conference with us. Frank, welcome again, welcome. Thank you and good afternoon to you all. So guys, what are we going to do? We are going to have an animated discussion. Um, we'd like to start with the situation that we are currently living in. Um, we have, we still have the pandemic. Now in Belgium, uh, we have seen already a few softenings of the so-called lockdown. And what we also see is that there is already an increasing traffic. Uh, it seems that we still have not learned really from the past and that we continue with some kind of inefficiencies when it comes to mobility. Vincent, what is your thought on that? My thought is that I see um, an upcoming trend again with um, rental orders. Uh, so I confirm what you say, the transport, uh, individual transport is having a revival. But, you know, we saw numerous of studies uh, for changing working habits due to the global pandemic, and they expect 25 to 30 percent of the employees will continue to work for three days at home. So uh, this, of course, will have an effect on their demand for corporate and private mobility. So in that B2B context where we are strongly in, we observe an ever-growing demand to increase the flexibility of those company fleets and employees' expectations for company car characteristics change. So employees wish to vary between car models and sizes, between combustion and electric cars, so to come into the trend. And overall, they tend to uh, get along with smaller mileage packages, what comes along with your th thought as well a few seconds ago. The companies, mm -hmm. they wish to transform their rather rigid fleets, either purchased or leased, into a more flexible fleet, which allows for rapid in- and defleeting, but also better cost controlling, depending on their economic situation. So I see that coming up, what you said, but um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, this is an upwards trend now, like all the people go on leisure, on holiday, mm -hmm. and then it comes back to a lower normal than before. Hmm. Frank, I would like to continue with you. Working from home, we all do it. Do you think that we will keep on doing it? And with what effect, with what impact also on new mobility solutions and the adoption of those solutions? 
Well, f f first of all, I think I think it's right. You know, there there will be um sort of a, a balancing back to a certain 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 level, right? Um, and we see it. I'm I'm based in Stuttgart, and I was just mentioning earlier that you know this week um everybody's back at at school. The, all the kids are back at school, and and traffic has exploded from my perspective <laughs> this week um, compared to what I've I've experienced in the past few months. Um, mm -hmm. But the reality is also what Vincent said, is many corporates will allow, uh, and I've said that for basically almost 12, 14 months now um, at different times, that they will allow their employees to work from home more flexibly uh, going forward um, with different levels of, of certainty. Uh, what is the impact of that? The impact is that many people like us will decide um, that maybe it doesn't make sense to remain living where they do. Um, you know, people live within 45 minutes of their of their office, of their working place, uh, if they do not have to go to the office on a daily basis, what do they do? Um, what we are seeing in, you know, in many places already is people are starting to buy houses, second house, uh, second uh, condo um, in, in um, sort of a two, three, four hours away from their working place because they will have the possibility uh, to actually spend more time um, in remote uh, places um, mm -hmm. where they will have a, a better uh, standard of, of living in their, in their, in their, in their field. Um, what is the implication of that? The implication is not just the fact that we're potentially going to see a reverse trend in terms of urbanization, Potentially, uh, this is not done. This is one of the scenarios. Um, but also, what is the impact in terms of uh, commuting, in terms of public transport, uh, occupancy, like Shweta was saying, uh, saying earlier, but also in terms of the need for uh, private uh, vehicles that we are seeing increasing in the, in the short term right now, uh, especially on used car. Um, but also, you know, maybe the need for flexibility is going to be. Um, exacerbated uh, in, in, a, in a sense, right? To, to, to fit for that necessity for irregular long um, sort of a trip to the office uh, that you may do only, you know, two, three, four, five, six times a month instead of on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. need to adapt the, um, the, 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 the service, the, uh, the um, um, mobility solutions that are going to uh, come out of mm -hmm. uh, this situation. Okay, Hemko, um, if, and we heard it also in this conference, if those mobility managers and their employees want to ensure that they have a flexible and seamless on-demand mobility, yes, uh, in what way will development in technology be necessary uh, to support that are we already on the right track what are what is your opinion around technology to support that that's a big question and first of all maybe to just sort of confirm that also in day to day in our traffic data we see you know uh, indeed traffic is, is um, crawling up again and searching again in, in areas and indeed people are moving to private passenger vehicles but it's clear that if you look at what city authorities want to accomplish, they, of course, don't welcome even more private passenger vehicles entering their cities, right? That would get to bigger gridlocks, uh, higher congestion and higher emissions. And I don't think that that is what we collectively want. Um, so, yeah, I think it's all to do with, uh, with flexibility and also convenience for, for people. They move back to the private passenger vehicle because in this situation, it's convenient to them. It feels safe to them. Uh, but I think, indeed, technology can play a vital role in also making more public forms of, of transport and more shared forms of transport ever more convenient to use. Uh, and it's, this comes down to all of the stages of mobility. It's first of all, you know, planning your trip, uh, finding what modes of transportation are most fit for, for your intended journey. Uh, and then also it means that these forms of transportation actually need to be coordinated with each other. Uh, you might want to travel part of your journey uh, by train because that's very com comfortable and very convenient. But you like for the last miles or the last couple of kilometers actually hop over on a rental vehicle, on, on a shared vehicle, uh, potentially uh, ride hauling, etc. And I think in getting this system to coordinate well with each other, uh, these silos that are currently trying to create a one size fits all solution, I need to start to collaborate more effectively with each other by uh, sharing data uh, and acting uh, as transparent as possible. Uh, and technology can help, of course, to build those connections between between the different offerings. Okay. In the end, if we want to you know, solve mobility for the, for the better for everybody, uh, yeah, we need to have less 
big solutions for for uh, to cover a big part of the problem, but more niche solutions that collaborate with each other uh, effectively. Uh, but then make that as convenient as possible for the end user uh, to consume. Okay, Vincent, um, one of the let's say um, expectations, also the concerns that mobility managers have towards suppliers is that apparently they don't see uh, much aggregation and let's say uh, collaboration when it comes to different mobility suppliers working together offering an integrated solution um, do you think that we will take in the upcoming years really a big leap when it comes to that or will that always be a struggle like for example with leasing companies sharing data has also always been a struggle for example yeah, I know that from the past up to the time that the uh, European Court took a decision on who is the owner of the data, from my point of view, that was always very obvious and clear that the final owner is the client. So, uh, you know, we are very open to any kind of cooperation model. And already uh, today we work and cooperate not only with other mobility providers, but also with strategic partners like uh, Google. Um, therefore, yeah, I think uh, depending on the goal of a corporation, we have multiple ways to inter establish interfaces to our mobility platform and exchange data for the creation of a seamless booking flow of any kind of mobility. I think we have proven that as well in the past because we have built the only platform uh, where you can have e-scooters, bicycles, public transport. We recently implemented uh, public transport in Hamburg, for example, into our app uh, and implemented our uh, solution into their app as well, where they can book cars, rent, ride services, and we will follow that path. Uh, so we are not defining the world, but we are a part of that mobility world. And I think the more companies behaving like we do, the less gaps we will have in future in uh, a seamless less offer for all of the uh, people on public and on uh, private and uh, private and corporate transport. Okay, I see Remco, you are nodding yes. Something to add there? No, no but I, I really like this point, right? I think in the end, uh, it's pretty clear in GDPR who, who in the end owns that data and that's the consumer. They are empowered to want to make that change. And I think they can also drive that change. And it's really good to see companies indeed collaborating both ways. It's not uh, one company aggregating everything, but it's uh, companies collaborating both ways and contributing to each other's offerings. And I think that's super relevant because there will always be people biased towards one mode of transportation that want the complementary uh, next mode of tra transportation and the other way around. And I think as long as companies collaborate with each other, they can help serve both markets better. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's really key. Also key is in that, uh, you know, um, basically data standards uh, to enable uh, easy exchange of information, uh, like we saw in public transport in the past, now in bike sharing, uh, next also in car sharing and on demand mobility. These standards will also make it much easier uh, to interface between different companies. Uh, and, and that's key uh, so that it doesn't become a lengthy and, and, and costly uh, uh, endeavor to try to incorporate each other's offering, but you can actually work along uh, common standards. Uh, I think that's also absolutely critical. Okay, Frank, um, what we also saw in the survey that we did and presented the highlights this morning is that if you look at the mobility solutions that those corporates have already implemented, they are often uh, car-centric organized. So it's car sharing, car pooling, um, uh, e-mobility with cars and so on. Now, looking into the future, they would like to implement also micro mobility and other solutions. Yes. And um, how do you see that? What kind of solutions do you think will really uh, become more easy to include and will also be more, let's say, um, yeah, accepted by the employees to be used in the near future? Well, I, I think I think we need to start from 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 two angles. In fact, um, one is the employee understand what the what are, what are the needs from the employees from a commuting and, tra and travel perspective for everything from planning to to expense management, uh, because that's what everything is. It needs to be to be taken into consideration. But also understand what uh, what Laura was mentioning earlier. What what are they trying? To, what is a corporate trying to achieve? Uh, why are they why are they doing it in the first place? There's different reasons um, uh, with different shapes of grace in between uh, those, those, those reasons. So understanding you know, what the corporate wants to achieve, understanding the, uh, the employee, 
starting from there to actually design the the, the right um, mobility solutions for them. Uh, I'm not, and that uh, is the role that digitization can take in uh, bringing um, in a flexible, scalable manner the building blocks and solutions and ecosystem of partners uh, that actually delivers upon those requirements, both in the front end, the experience, the UX, and in the back end, uh, the facilitation uh, of the administration from a, from a corporate perspective. I think that that is, is critical. But for that, we need that ecosystem to be open, cooperation uh, to be uh, implemented within that environment. Okay. Maybe to jump into this point, yes. if I may. Oh. <laughs> I think we're both eager, Vincent. You go first. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think uh, th we are in a mobility market where different silos grow together. And if you see where the silos come from, from an organizational point of view, like an OEM who does not own any data uh, or does not know even the data because the dealerships know the data of their clients. You take a leasing company, the driving system of a leasing company, the IT is based on the leasing object, the car. And fleet managers work as well on the leasing object, the car. A rental car companies work, for example, on the driver of a car. So a rental car company, it's, it's much simpler to take that perspective uh, into your current environment. And therefore, it's much easier to build interfaces to get that into one pot. What you said, uh, Remco, was 100% true that the uh, standardization of the interfaces, but you need to see where the angles, where everybody is coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And Remco, you also... Yeah, to, to jump in on Frank's point, I think indeed it's going to be the combination of em employer and employee that collectively mm -hmm. is going to define what, it, what makes most sense. And I think as a technology company, tr we try to be as neutral as possible and basically aggregate uh, in, as an, in an objective way, but allow employers to configure the, our planning tools uh, and basically add curation. Say, you know, we like our employees in the morning to travel by... Know, be driven rather than travel by themselves uh, or while they're doing uh, phone calls in the car we prefer them to actually uh, be driven so or whatever they want to curate it's their business logic what they deem relevant to their employees and then on top of that it's the employee that still needs to be able to add personal flavor that fits their uh, you know daily practice so i think it's about two levels of customization first curation from the employee employer uh, out of the total offering what seems relevant for them and for their employee base and then it's about that last personalization from the from the consumer that still needs to be uh, uh, done. And I think technology enables this, these levels of customization on top of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramke, do you also see possible synergies between scheduled and on-demand mobility? Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's one of those examples. Uh, you know, uh, scheduled or, or public transport sometimes mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, is very effective in high-dense urban areas where there's dedicated infrastructure to serve the, these modes of transportation. So tram lines, train lines, and these kind of things you're quite often faster at beating traffic, right, uh, that way. But it's it's not as effective when uh, the area is less densely populated and you need to travel those last miles to your final destination. And that's where I think private modes of transportation, on-demand mobility, shared vehicles, uh, they really play a vital role in complementing the network there. Because if you tr would try to optimize scheduled mobility and public transport or to cover the entire world, yeah, it's not going to be at very effective at the edges of their network. And the other way around, if you try to make the entire world fit for private passenger vehicles uh, to travel, it's of course going to be too dense uh, uh, in, in downtown urban areas. So yeah, I think there's a lot of synergies between these modes of transportation. And again, they would need to uh, ensure interoperability uh, and, and coordinate between themselves. Okay. Um, we even try to, sorry, Stephen, we even try to combine that, by the way, with our rental car fleet, where we push cars into share that you can use for ride as well and vice versa. So, uh, therefore, we try to bring together on-demand and pre-book. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you increase the utilization of those vehicles. Very true, Stephen. Okay. Very true. That is the uh, logic behind. Okay. Good. Uh, I would like to continue with you, uh, Vincent. Um, we see also that corporate mobility managers are sometimes struggling to incorporate some mobility solutions. Um, in the results of the polls that we organized, um, we asked, are you planning to offer corporate car sharing to your employees in the next 12 months? So almost 50-50 say yes or no. Yes. So what is for you the trick to successfully 
incorporate corporate car sharing in a large organization? Yeah. Um, first of all, we offer virtual implants, uh, which means you can have cars moving from one to another place, open uh, in an open environment or a closed environment. Uh, I think there is for no fleet manager on this planet a hurdle to jump into that concept. Uh, what is not safe is in former times everybody traveled to the office and now with the home office where we started the discussion, it's not sure how many people will commute with those cars. For pool fleets, this is an easy one, uh, but for the rest coming to the office, this is difficult. And the more decentralized and uh, not urbanized you are, the more need you have for those concepts uh, because there is less... Um, less public transport available but with our app i think you can have a very perfect solution for both environments in a city and outside the city so i don't see any uh, point why you should not implement that mm -hmm. frank yeah what is your vision I, I think I think the the um, it, it is it is critical uh, to, uh, to to bring those those world those world together. Um, I think the the um, um, sh share you know sharing um, asset is going to become a, a, a critical need. As I mentioned, is is it is increasingly unacceptable, right? To to have unutilized assets on one on one hand. On the other hand. Um, we we have an increasing uh, requirement for flexibility and access to mobility provided by uh, the employee to the to by the employer to the employee, um, and that is part of the expectation as well uh, from the from the uh, the employee's perspective. So being able to provide that flexibility uh, between um, um, own fleet corporate car corporate car sharing or other solutions uh, is. Is, is 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 increasingly critical um, for me I, I i agree with vincent the um, um corporate car sharing when it comes to pool cars this is a no-brainer right this is you know the the uh, there's no there's no discussions to 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 be have there mm -hmm. um, they, uh, and it, it is going to uh, to to be uh, to to increase in my mind in that, in that space uh, um, we need to look at corporate car sharing as, um, you know, actually all all pool cars should be car, corporate car sharing. Um, the, the, what is the difference between the two? One is is enabled with um, digital technology uh, that allows for a better utilization, um, and that's the difference that I'm making between the between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. And this as is therefore a no-brainer for any corporates to actually implement. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Something to say on shared mobility? Uh, no, and, and, and corporate cars. Like, I, of course, I'm an employer as well. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, I, I do see, uh, you know, we are a tech company with a lot of young software development talent. And, you know, they are participants in this sharing economy anyway. So I think they are quite eager to adopt these things, especially if it comes with little perks, like being absolutely ensured that you have a parking location near the office. It's an absolute critical one. Uh, and, you know, those are the little things that you can do, I think, while rolling out these schemes. To, to make sure that it will also get adopted. Uh, and I, I think that's key. It's also one of the reasons why we see a lot of uh, young, younger colleagues uh, also you know, jumping into electric cars. Um, yeah, it's financially interesting, but it's also just super convenient. You know you're going to always have a parking spot near the office uh, with, a, with a charging location. So yeah, I think it's, um, you know, we need to also just find those, th those uh, little drivers in human behavior that make this attractive. Uh, and um, it, it, it's sometimes these little things that can make, can make that difference. Uh, while you're utilizing these things, it's all about transparency. Who who's currently got it? Uh, where is it going? Uh, can I use it? What's the range left? Uh, yeah, and I think again, technology, uh, tracking technology, the digitization, as Frank calls it, uh, yeah, it's, it's critical. It's vital to that. Um, so you need to bring that up to the surface, and then I think it's uh, it's gonna then it's just gonna be uh, yeah normal to um, yeah to collectively utilize these very uh, expensive resources. Mm -hmm. um, Vincent, you are, of course, also a user of mobility. Um, as a user, what is your biggest frustration if you use mobility? Yeah, it is a topic that you mentioned uh, before. If it's not seamless, you know, and you get stuck anywhere uh, and you have no way out uh, on the first few, how to take the next step. 
but uh, with solutions like on-demand uh, ride services, you are having a good option to uh, come out of that situation. Uh, but there is quite often uh, a high level of frustration if delays come up, for example, and you are against the plan. Um, therefore, uh, you need to have that seamless um, experience that even if there is a delay, you have a chance to uh, find a way home. Mm -hmm. So uh, technology, uh, I'm with Remco there, technology plays a big role. And uh, the, the technology is improving so quickly from so many providers. When you paint that mobility field, uh, how many players there are, especially in the Benelux, it is really impressive what is coming up there. So I'm of a big confidence that uh, in two, three years, we will have solutions that we do not dream today of. Uh, Frank, do you think, uh, going forward on what Vincent was just mentioning, uh, if we see indeed that uh, there are new companies that have services and solutions in mobility, can we expect a massive consolidation of the market in the upcoming years? Uh, uh, considering the level of fragmentation, first of all, we had a very early stage of development. Let's face it. Um, second, we have an extremely fragmented market, right? Um, not not even at the, at the at the regional level, not even at country level, but at at the, at the city level. <laughs> um, and you could even, you know, for big cities, it's some uh, some players are even in in certain areas only of the cities. Uh, so. Let, you know, is, is this going to consolidate? Yes, it has to. This is this is this is going to be a volume market in the in the end. So um, it it will consolidate. Uh, but this phase of development, this is critical to the innovation that we have to 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 build within this this space. Um, and, and we need to nurture it. Uh, in fact, uh, to to continue that that innovation um, and help to um, drive that integration capacity. I think, you know, those examples that Vincent was taking uh, about, you know, being stuck somewhere, uh, um, having a, a delayed ETA, uh, these are extremely frustrating situations. Um, data, uh, data management, technology is going to help overcome that if we are able to actually bring it together. That visibility um, from end to end, from planning to um, um, sort of a travel is, is critical. Okay. Uh, Remco, what can we expect from you and HAIR Technologies to make, uh, let's say, everything related to data and data intelligence even, let's say, more usable for a seamless mobility in the future? Uh, well, that's a big question, uh, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we're doing. So I think it's about uh, trying to, uh, to basically integrate all of these mobility offerings uh, in standard ways, as standard as possible, and also drives that standardization so that it becomes much easier to interface with these things. It's about creating that transparency that Frank also uh, explained, right, and offering choice to the user. It's not so much about the magic of trying to stitch together uh, the smartest possible mode of transportation, because I think, uh, to Frank's point, you know, we're in, in early times, so there's a lot to learn still. So I think we actually need, we are training the system more. So we need to offer choice to consumers. They need to be able to uh, select personal preferences while we are learning collectively on what is actually smart. Uh, there's a lot of fake smartness out there, I think, um, uh, that is trying to do some magic and, and come up with the best possible intermodal advice. Uh, quite often those, th those things from, from an experienced consumer point of view feel a bit dumb uh, to, to, to be sure. So I think what it is more about, it's about creating that transparency and interoperability and offering choice to consumers and collectively learning uh, on what kind of consumer profiles fit, what kind of smart solution. Um, and yeah, we're ready to, uh, to facilitate that. Nice to hear that. Vincent, what can we expect from Sixth to make our corporate mobility even more seamless than it is today? Um, digitalization and tech development uh, is and will be one of the most important topics when it comes to mobility within Sixth. That's why our uh, co-CEO Alexander Six also said back in 2019, we are not a car rental company with IT attached, we are the tech company with attached car rentals. So uh, therefore this point pinpoints the relevance of the tech of our business model and seamless means minimizing gaps with uh, your user journey and therefore technology and partnerships are two main pillars for us to close as many gaps along the customer journey. What Frank mentioned before, the integration of partners being the platform above a single offering. Uh, this is what we are going to do and uh, by ourselves we will surely roll out our 
uh, network of rental uh, branches and our share solutions, which we brought last year into the Netherlands. And we will continue to internationalize that in more markets with electric cars, hybrid cars, and with uh, combustion engines, depending how big the area is and the charging infrastructure, which is given in that uh, respect. So I, with that financial condition where the company is in, I expect a big rollout on uh, further partners and on share solutions with us. Frank, what does Europe need to do to keep its position uh, that it wants to have in leading, let's say, the uh, corporate mobility and smart mobility ecosystem? I think I think there's a role in 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 uh, in, in driving policies uh, to you know in a in a broader spectrum towards sustainability, uh, to, but also you know dry, driving um, um, investment in digitization. I think that 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 is probably the single area that will not only benefit mobility, corporate mobility, but the broader mobility and and beyond. Um, and the next step is autonomous, which will bring uh, significant, um, you know, uh, additional uh, benefits uh, in terms of safety, in terms of efficiency, uh, in terms of efficiency, in terms of utilization of assets, uh, asset being the vehicle and the infrastructure um so you know there, there's a there's a long road of great great development uh, for us to improve the way we move from a to b both from a, a consumer perspective as well as from a corporate perspective okay yeah uh, thank you very much thank you guys thank you for the uh, enlightening discussion would like to thank remco timmer of here technologies vincent Flans of sixth and frank levec of rost and sullivan um remco and vincent i'm already going to say goodbye to both of you frank is going to stay with me for the closing words thank you very much guys hey thank enjoy you. a great uh, cold drink later on Stephen. yes we will yeah bye 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 bye, -bye. Take bye, -bye. Care. you have heard it <laughs>